Great. So hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Paula Quigley. I'm from Serve and I'm joined today by Anne Marr, the director of the Urban Co-op in Limerick and Lisa Fingleton, who's a writer, filmmaker, artist and a grower. And uh, we are coming together today as we have one common denominator that brings us together. Um, it brought us together last year and it's the Served Up Cookbook. So uh, Serve created this cookbook as a response uh, to community fundraising pretty much stopping due to the pandemic uh, last year and this year as well. So it's it's a journey of resilience basically to keep us going and to keep funds coming in. And we also wanted to offer people a chance to explore the world through their kitchen uh, with recipes that we've gathered in all the different countries that Serve work in. And the proceeds, the proceeds of the cookbook generate funds that make a significant impact and a sustainable change in communities that we work in in southern africa india and southeast asia because um, last year for example we offered pandemic relief support supported educational opportunities for young people uh, we upgraded and developed some classrooms and an evolution block um, we offered life skills training programs to young people and sustainable community development project support um, and we're also helping to fight the stigma um, of young pe of people with disabilities as well. So supporting this cookbook isn't just mean you're getting a cookbook, uh, you're also helping us to tackle poverty in the majority world. So that's enough of me talking. I am very, very happy to introduce uh, Lisa first to, to, uh, to come in and tell us a bit about yourself and how you've met us and a little bit about the cookbook that you were involved in last year too and, and all the great work you're doing. So yeah, great to be here and thank you for the invitation. So yes, I'm Lisa and I suppose how my connection with Serve was because Serve is involved um, with a project that we visited in a couple in, in the Philippines a couple of years ago in Cebu. So it's um, we went to visit um, one of the sisters presentation systems who works with the Bajau tribe in Cebu City. And we spent a couple of weeks there uh, making a film and working with young people, working with the community. And then when we came back, we realized that there was a lovely connection with Serve. So we, I was delighted to get involved in the in the cookbook. And uh, so we, we farm here in North Kerry. We have a certified organic farm. Uh, we grow most of our own food. And uh, we also run a number of projects that encourage people to um, eat local food. So oh, I don't know, it must be maybe three years ago now, I would have written a book um, This called The Local Food Project. And it was because I suppose I was more and more concerned about the fact that we're importing so much food, you know, and even food that maybe is labeled Irish now, very few of the ingredients are coming from, you know, our farms are coming from Ireland. And I was thinking, gosh, something has to be done about this. And why are we not taking action, especially when we know the impact of climate change on the world and particularly the most vulnerable people in the world. And I really felt that we needed to start looking at our food consumption and, and eating local food. So I would have started a 30 day local food challenge where people eat only local food in September. And that's not to punish people. It sounds really cruel. <laughs> it sounds quite hard, but it's about looking at the labels on things and thinking, you know, what, what is actually growing on this Ireland island and, and what can I eat? Because by eating local food, I've, I've written here in the book, you know, you actually reduce food miles and carbon. You actually reduce single use plastic because especially now in the pandemic, we've noticed that everything has been wrapped more and more in plastic. So by picking food from your garden or by, by growing food at a local market, getting it from the market or the urban co-op, or, you know, you're, you're more likely to get food that isn't wrapped in plastic. And um, it directly supports local growers. So this is globally, you know, I think um, in, in lots of communities around the world, people take this for, for granted. You know, they, they grow their own food or they buy it from the local market. I've been to lots of different countries around the world and markets are just a way of life. Where you support local growers but we've become disconnected in Ireland I think from from food thankfully there's lots of places where we can be connected and then just I think it's about eating food that's fresh and healthy you know there's a lot of talk in Ireland about obesity and you know mental health and well-being but if our food isn't healthy and good then you know what hope do we have then I, I do feel so that it's about resisting you know capital assistance that say the food is only about profit and it's also about um, climate change, you know, that we, we have to take action around um, climate and take responsibility for climate and stop importing, you know, you know, avocados that we know are 
as a result of maybe cutting down rainforest in another country and that are traveling thousands of miles to be eaten. And it's not to say that I don't like all this food that comes from around the world, but we should be making an effort, I feel, to make more of our diet local. Thank you so much for sharing. And um, absolutely. And even at the minute, serves running a volunteer program called Think Global, Act Local. And part of that is um, a module about, you know, for sustainable consumption and what can people actively do at home in Ireland or wherever home is to to make a difference. And that comes in a global aspect as well, you know, because um, the, the footprint that food traveling halfway across the world leaves is quite large. Uh, and we have so much um, soil here in Ireland that we can grow here in Ireland. So it's, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. It's, it's like a, a disconnection that, that we do need to address. So I'd like to introduce Anne Marr now to come in and share her story because we've come from Lisa, who's talking about growing and um, what we can do here in Ireland. But how do people access this food as well who can't even grow it themselves? So Anne. Hi, it's Anne here now from the Urban Co-op. Um, first of all, delighted to take part in this and interesting that we're three ladies from about five miles away from each other where we originate. But um, the Urban Co-op is a community cooperative that's been in operation now since 2013 and taking on board all the issues that Lisa has talked about, we really were very interested in getting involved with the Serve Cookbook because we were introduced to it by one of your volunteers, one of your original volunteers. And she was um, associated with one of our suppliers, the Dune Social Farm. And she told me about the project of the cookbook and she said, you have to get involved. This would really be right up your street. And the more I heard about it, the more I thought, well, it was a no brainer. And then getting to know Paula and, you know, discussing the origins of Serve, etc. It really resonated with me personally because I've worked in Africa too for about five years and I was involved with Kolov maybe, must be 20, 30 years ago now at this stage. And the idea of bringing back that knowledge back home and implementing it um, resonated very strongly with me. But I've been involved here with the Urban Co-op now for near about eight years now. And the idea of accessing local food, while on the one hand, I was involved with nutrition education and teaching home economics and all of that, the whole food line, you can educate people about good food. But for a lot of people, it became increasingly more and more difficult to access good food. And one of the things I discovered as on the journey too was the idea that a lot of the producers themselves didn't actually believe in what they were doing. And a lot of the really good producers weren't getting the support they needed to stay going, to be sustainable for themselves. So I suppose the idea of the Urban Co-op, it, it has evolved over the years, but it really is about connecting the supplier with the consumer. And in the journey of that connection is getting the consumer to appreciate the work that's been involved and putting that appreciation onto the value of the product and paying a decent price to keep the supplier in business. And to date, now we have a lot of suppliers and we have employed 11 people and uh, we're working to be a model cooperative on how this can, can work. So it can happen, it can work. And uh, I'm delighted to say that by showcasing the local foods through the cookbook as well, it helps to keep the spotlight on what you can do locally in order to keep this going and I'm very proud of what the urban co-op has achieved but it's it's like as a model that other communities can replicate and say well this is an example of the circular economy it's it's connecting the supplier to the consumer and and keeping it thinking locally and acting locally thank you for sharing and can you tell us about the recipes that you sponsor for the the served up cookbook in particular and, and maybe where for example, if you were in Limerick, where you can source the food or source the ingredients to make those recipes? Well, when you asked us to take part in a cookbook, uh, obviously the decision is, well, what recipes are you going to pick? And we wanted to showcase what was tradition about, traditional about Limerick and also what we could source very, very close by to us. Now, the two recipes that we've chosen, one is healing oxtail stew and the other is the bangers and mash. Now, Limerick is also known as pig town and there is a long history of the relationship with pork 
And we wanted to showcase that, but we also wanted to showcase, say, it's dairy country and it's the Golden Vale. So the recipes include butter and milk. And the idea of using oxtail as well in the stew was the idea of, of going back to the nose to tail, using all of the animal. We would have a lot of international customers as well. This is actually one of the products. We have a lot of African customers who come in and oxtail happens to be one of their favorite foods. And we often discuss recipes. And this has been a recipe that we've started to use ourselves and, and bring back an old traditional recipe. And we would often eat it ourselves there in the winter time when the place is very cold because the heating isn't great. So we would have practiced this recipe, but actually found it very sustaining for us. Now, so we deliberately picked those recipes based on those ingredients are all, I suppose, within 20 kilometers. Thank you so much. Um, and it's, it's amazing to have Irish recipes in the book, in the cookbook as well, because we have recipes from like all over the world. And the first chapter is Ireland and it's, it's really great. The start of it is, is an article by Lisa Fingleton on climate action by eating locally as well. Lisa, can you tell us like, why should we care about food sustainability and responsible food consumption and, and eating locally? So um, I suppose eating is something that we all do, you know, and um, sometimes when we talk about climate change and biodiversity loss, it can feel very far out. And if you're not as in far from you and you can't do anything about it, or it can feel like something that's going to happen to millions of people far away. And so people can sort of deny that it exists. Whereas no matter where you live, whether you live in a city or you live in the countryside, you still eat. And it is something that people can make choices about. And it doesn't have to be that all of your budget is spent every week on, on, on very expensive things where you can start to introduce food that you can afford. And, and, um, and I, just think, I just think it's really, really important because I think it, it, it solves so many problems in one bowel soup, you know? You've like, is it 30% of, of food goes into the bin before it's ever eaten? I mean, that's just criminal statistic in my view. When I suppose we're growing, we know the effort it takes to get potatoes out of a field in a wet climate. Do you know what I mean? I, I walked that field out there now um, two months ago and it was up to my ankles in water. So you're just always watching the weather. You're so dependent on weather. These extreme weather events, um, we lost all our aspen blossoms in one storm in two hours you know, two years ago. So it, it has a massive impact on growers and farmers, the weather, and it's to try and, and I suppose, make the link between people who are the consumers and, and say to them, look, at by actually supporting farmers and growers, you enable people to live in rural Ireland as well and grow food. And I think there's been really good initiatives, like in Copenhagen, they brought an initiative where they said that all the food served in state-run institutions like hospitals and schools would be organic, and would come from within, I think, a 20 mile radius of Copenhagen. And already that's way exceeded all their expectations in terms of how successful that was. And that means that people who are sick or young children are eating good, healthy food that comes from the local biosphere, that comes from the local farm. That has knock on implications for generations in terms of health and, and, and everything, you know, in terms of our society. So I, I just think, I think it's a simple thing that people can do. I do think there's, a lot of resistance you know people always say oh but what about cheap food you know the cheap food most people can't afford this expensive food but really organic food and good food is the real price of food everything else is subsidized or somebody else somewhere in the world is paying the price so we're here today talking about serve and you work with people and we all know people who are working in different countries around the world who are not living a sustainable wage who are practically living in slavery so that we can eat this so-called cheap food there is no such thing. There's either animals or there's people or there's the environment, the trees that are suffering so that we can eat this so-called cheap food. It drives me mad when people talk about cheap food because in my opinion, there's no such thing. agree um lisa that you know it is an argument people will have with us as well about the price of food and we said that the price is paid by somebody yeah. 
And uh, we would also see here in Ireland, like the suicide rate of farmers is something very, very worrying. And like, based on what has happened in America and in India, we need to prevent that happening. You know, because if we don't mind our farmers and if we don't mind the custodians of the land, we won't have that food. We will have to resort then to factory farmed or processed food. So we, we mind those custodians as much as possible and, and give them the respect by valuing their produce and their work. And, and I, I just think it, it has such a knock-on impact. I mean, so many schools now are trying to educate children. They're trying to put in polytunnels. And, you know, you see children tasting real carrots and they're like, oh my God, this tastes like a sweet. You know, it's, it's so sweet to them because that's the real taste of a carrot or the real taste of a tomato. And I just think when people get the chance to grow their own food, A, they get super excited. And yeah, they can get terribly you know, frustrated when things don't work out but they have a connection with it and they, they won't eat in the same way again, I feel, if they, if they mm. try to grow something. No, absolutely. Um, I know that we're doing a little project in the co-op at the moment in relation to food empathy and the collective empathy. Once you understand what, what goes on, um, it makes you think differently about it. And I guess that's the importance of volunteering, you know, whether you volunteer, you know, as a global volunteer and you work somewhere, but also we would have volunteers here on the farm. So we're a social farm. So people with disabilities come here on a Friday and they grow food. And I remember one of the women, she was like, I'm not a farmer. I'm glamour. Like, I love my glittery boots, my glittery hat. I don't want to be a farmer. But the minute she arrived here, she was like, oh, yeah, I could do, I could do this. And she talked about bringing home the organic potatoes to her mother for dinner. And her mother was like so impressed that, that she was getting, she was after growing these and, and bringing them home for dinner. So, you know, there's really something in, um, in, in volunteering on farms as well. You know, we have people who come here now since the, the, the lockdown lifted who are back, you know, and they're, they're growing food. And it's just to see the excitement in them and the joy of volunteering and sharing together and the crack and the fun. I mean, it's so, it's so, so important. I think it's great for people who maybe don't have land themselves to say to farmers, do you need a hand? Because, and you'd know this, it's so hard for people who are trying to do this commercially to make mm. a living. And, and a lot of organic farms are reliant on, on volunteers and a lot of goodwill to get the food to the customers, you know? I would say though, Lisa, that, um, well, obviously, there, there would be certain farmers that have built a good solid reputation and it's been lovely in the last few years to see it improving. I've been mentally noting the children coming into the shop in the recent week. I've just actively been asking myself to just take note because often from a teaching point of view, you're there talking about the problems of obesity and the problems of you know the diets etc but it's actually been nice to see healthy children shopping so it is making a difference people can change and i also noticed like we have certain farmers like jim cronin who would be well known in the area where people queue up to go and volunteer because he has built the reputation of of being solid and being um, having those standards. So people have tasted it in his food and it has translated to people wanting to be educated on his land. And he's now, you know, talking about succession and, and passing it on. So people have done a lot of work and, and it, the work is ongoing, but it is lovely to actually acknowledge there are results there too. They're green shoots, but it's, it's so encouraging. We, we see a, a large number of farmers, you know, converting now to organic. And that's so fantastic here in North Kerry. And, you know, friends of ours put a stall up a couple of weeks ago. She said she was sold out by 11 o'clock. She put it outside her house. She couldn't keep the vegetables. So I do think, I do think one of the good things that have come out of the last year is that people have a huge appreciation of what's important. They have a huge appreciation of health. You know, we're, we're, yes, we can focus on the ecological breakdown and all the negative things that may happen. But I think, I think if we can take steps, um, we'll be, you know, it's important. I do believe, too, that uh, activities that inspire that hope and imagination are really, really important to keep people motivated to keep going. Because, you know, all the, the news about climate change and everything being 
so negative it does get people into that sense of despair and that paralyzes people mm -hmm. so the idea that actually there is something you can do and you can do it on your own doorstep and every small little bit adds up and I do think you know it's all like a huge huge jigsaw and everyone plays their part but it's amazing how you can I suppose when you get a critical mass of people it starts to really shift and change so I think the pandemic has really been helpful definitely for the food movements where people have definitely shifted back and gone you know actually this is really important now and they're they are focusing more on on local food and supporting local I'm sitting here in our front room and I'm just watching out the window I'm just watching customers going by in and out in and out in and out it's become normal that's amazing it's it's it you're right though it is there's a there has been a bit of a shift with people thinking more locally and it's great as well that you mentioned about volunteering and you were feeling down about things happening in the world and uh, the, even the pandemic, getting your hands dirty and putting soil on your hands and, uh, you know, doing something like that could be could be something that's very valuable and uh, very good for you as well, you know, good for the soul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we're building on a legacy. I mentioned hippies, you know, we're building on a legacy of people who have done the most extraordinary work, you know, people in the 60s and 70s and 80s who, you know, just paved the way in all of this. And uh, we owe them such a credit because people were talking about this and they were, as Anne said, labelled as hippies and ignored and, you know, not listened to. But actually, they were right. They were saying the planet is in crisis. Um, the butterflies are dying, the bees are dying, and people were dismissing them. And I think, you know, it's becoming mainstream now um, that people are talking about, obviously, hugely mainstream. But, um, you know, we owe, we owe a huge credit to the people who were talking about this for, for decades, you know. You know, when, when you look at a really bad storm um, that happens and, and how it wipes out, I just look at the flooding in Mozambique a few years ago it was last year actually and you can look at that image and you think oh that's that's shocking and that's awful and then people forget but what they don't realize is that a lot of those farmers were in debt to big companies big multinational companies who are selling the seed i mean we were talking about this in development education 20 30 years ago it hasn't improved that farmers have huge debt and when these cyclones happen and their fields get destroyed that debt doesn't go away and the fields are destroyed for you know possibly a year two years where are the animals gone? Where's the seed gone? So it has long-term implications, all of those extreme weather events. Yeah, but I, I think as well the, you know, the, the over-reliance on a cash crop, a monoculture, mm -hmm. like when you put all your eggs in the one basket, as they say, then if something happens, then that's gone. Whereas I suppose when I grew up, you know, the farming culture would have been you have a mixture of tillage and you know animals etc so one crop may have failed but another supported it so the idea of yeah diversity as well to help sustain the resilience of a local economy again that's a big shift in thinking because a lot of Irish farmers particularly would be encouraged to go big as much as possible and and go that monoculture but the idea of staying a bit smaller diversifying and having having something alternative but again it, it countries are doing it farming communities are doing it in in a small scale but it's going to take a while for it to get to a critical mass here i suppose we've been very focused on food but i suppose because of climate change and biodiversity loss we've we've kind of expanded as well what we're doing here so we run a project called the barn away and we we bought back 10 acres and we planted 10,000 trees last summer, last June, just before it got too late to plant trees. But, you know, just to try and do things, because I know when I see other people doing things, it gives me a huge motivation. And when people come here, yeah, they, they expect the food because they know we do the food. But now we've got a 20 minute loop walk around these baby trees and they're all native trees. And the energy of that is just extraordinary because we've, We've, been, we've had the privilege of visiting other farmers and seeing what they're doing. We've, you know, working with you in the urban co-op and everything. And traveling, we've you know, worked in Brazil and different places. So it's so important because I think if we don't, you mentioned it earlier, Anne, if we start 
getting depressed and and you know and I know people do and people really are suffering with anxiety and everything but I know for me personally when I'm when I'm down I'm no good to anybody do you know so if I let myself go down at all sure I, I'm no good so I have to find a way to, to to have a balance and to believe and that's why these projects are so important because they allow us to believe in a future and to see it in action and that that brings the sustainable development goals it brings the earth charter it brings everything to um to to, to life you know it's not just academic and, and that's why we went to Fintorn because i thought can it really be possible that there is a community that size who are living sustainably and my expectations were so high i'd, I'd be so disappointed because it couldn't possibly live up to it and then you get there and you realize that it that it is and we came home with such energy from that i thought mm -hmm. Yeah, we can do it. We can do it all together. We can do it, not on our own. Yeah, it's like charging a battery, isn't it? Yeah. 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 yeah no. And you need you need it, but you need a source. You need an energy source, and that's what we. That's what I think. All the people who are doing their best are like little energy sources, you know, sustainable energy sources for us all to plug into. But you definitely need the example. And um, I um I I I'm now the visual artist in residence with the Kerry County Council. It's the first time they've had an artist in residence and because of the pandemic and lockdown I've been doing it here on the farm and I was thinking I'm going to do it on on uh, biodiversity and climate specifically art and I had 500 people at a workshop here two weeks ago Isn't that incredible on a farm down in Boreen in North Kerry and there was 500 people I couldn't believe it I was like wow and they were all mainly children interested in biodiversity they were bouncing up and down to show me pictures of bees and butterflies and plants and I thought, you know, the future is good. And, and that really, I was so excited to, to see their interest. Um, I think, you know, I think the schools have, are really trying to, to make shape in this and, and trying to move forward with the children, which is very exciting. Very exciting. Absolutely. That's brilliant to hear. Um, and like serve also are supporting uh, farming projects and uh, agricultural colleges in Mozambique and Zambia too, because there's, there is a need in, in areas even um, overseas as well to teach young people how to farm as well. And uh, it's, it's something that is needed in Ireland too. <laughs> and uh, there's plenty of information um, available online, I know. And I'm sure, Lisa, like the, you have uh, lots of information that people could could extract knowledge from from you um, through your books and different ways if they wanted to, to grow and urban co-op I'm sure you've got good tips for your customers and everything um, to to excite people maybe to try and grow a bit more as well I certainly would love to it is it's great it is great but one of the things that while there are a lot of people who are growing but there are a lot of people like myself who don't have the time too busy doing other stuff but it's nice to have a place that you can access that food mm. where other people are supported to, to grow and like the simplest ways i suppose for people watching this to to do that is to, to look at farmers markets in their areas you know try and grow if they can but not everybody has that luxury and you know even the space just try and buy produce that's made locally um you know so grow your own shop local is the, is the main message really isn't it and, and encourage encourage like if you're if you have counselors that you're connected to encourage them to start changing their procurement rules i don't know why we don't have hospitals sourcing food from local farmers instantly changes everything schools let school meals be sourced from within 20 miles of a school support local farmers that are growing food get your carrots get your potatoes and that should be, I think the laws and the procurement laws we change that it's not about the cheapest food that we can buy, but the food that is going to enhance the circular economy that's actually going to grow economies as opposed to destroy them. People can't compete. A local farmer can't compete with carrots for 50 cents from a supermarket. Mm. You know, there's farmers talking about plowing carrots back into the ground because they can't compete. And so if we, if we keep that system going, when we could just change the rules. And instantly change the system, you know? Mm. But it's system change, not climate change. Well, I, I think the policy makers, you know, there is a point when you get to a critical mass as the population that the policy makers start taking note. And, you know, when it comes around to the election times, they go, well, actually, yeah, I think that's a good idea now. But so, yes, policy, everything needs to happen. 
Yeah. Um, but I think never underestimate the power you have yourself. That's the, the thing. Don't wait. Don't wait for the politicians to make that decision. Make it today. Make it yourself. Next, everything you eat. And uh, it's amazing. It's amazing where on the journey it will bring you on. Amazing. That's an absolutely perfect way, I think, to end our conversation. Two powerful quotes there um, from Vodigi. And thank you very much for sharing everything today. It's been, it's been really nice chatting to you. So uh, if, if there's nothing else that you would like to add, I will finish our, our session. And uh, just thank everybody for watching. If you are interested, the maybe the 30 day local food challenge is something people could do. Is it in September, Lisa? On Facebook, there's a, there's a group called the Local Food Project. And so there's information about the challenge and everything in there. And also the website, lisafingleton.com. Great, perfect. And uh, Urban Co-op, you're well, The, Ur the you're Urban Co-op is open seven days. <laughs> so come down and see us. We are, um, we're always here. And um, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on the web serve as well the served up cookbook is available on our website serve.ie um, and that's available to purchase and right now as well so thank you both so much for your time today and for sharing um all all the knowledge that you have and the passion that you have as well is is amazing and i hope you both keep your keep very busy i'm sure you are already and i just hope nothing but um the best for you both Bye.